I'm Tamara Hafner, and I will be the moderator for today's session. I am a principal technical advisor here at the USAID MTAPS program. And um, I'm really looking forward to interacting with everyone today and I'm um, looking forward to a very productive and um, insightful discussion. Um, to get started, I'd like to introduce Alexis Leonard, who is a senior health systems technical advisor in the Bureau of Global Health at the Office of Health Systems at USAID. And she's a contract um, office representative for the USA, USAID MTAPS program. And um, we'll open the floor to Alexis to give a few opening remarks. Over to you, Alexis. Thanks so much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome and thanks to all of you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by USAID's MTAPS program. We're very excited to discuss the important topic on regulatory regional harmonization and hear from our expert panel gathered here today. Last week was an exciting time for USAID as we celebrated 60 years of development support. And within the past few decades, we've enjoyed collaboration with our partners, missions, and governments in the many aspects of regulatory system strengthening. And such support is often a lengthy process, but a well-earned one. Building strong regulatory systems is vital to the health and well-being of populations by ensuring access to quality and safe medicines, medical products, and vaccines. The importance of the reg regulatory system embodies is often overlooked, particularly within the supply chain system and its role to achieving national health goals. And the importance of this link has been highlighted even more during the COVID-19 pandemic, as countries have worked tirelessly to quickly receive new vaccines and products for their countries and maintain current health product needs. Building upon effective regulatory systems aligns very well with USAID's new health system strengthening vision 2030, as we try to roll out equitable and high-performing healthcare through accessibility, affordability, and reliability. We're now in a particularly interesting time in regulatory space with the recent ratification of the African Medicines Agency and the continued global efforts in this space. We look forward to this discussion around regional harmonization in Africa and how this can improve national health and economic goals. So thanks again to taking the time out today to have this discussion and turn it over to you and Taps. Thank you, Alexis. Um, so before we get um, further into the um, session, I just wanna go over a few house rules with everyone. Um, as you may have been notified by <laughs> Zoom, um, the session is being recorded and that's for dissemination purposes. Um, we ask that you keep yourselves muted when you're not speaking and of course unmute while you're speaking. We also ask that if you're speaking, um, we encourage you to turn your video on so that we can put a face on the name um, or the voice of the speaker. And we encourage the audience to please post your questions in the chat box as the session progresses. Um, there's a whole team uh, working to, who will be monitoring the questions and we'll do our very best to um, accommodate all the questions that um, arise during the session. Um, and especially in the panel discussion, please feel free to um, use a chat box and if needed, um, even the function to raise your hands and we'll call on you if the time allows. Um, for some simpler questions, we may just respond in the chat box to be efficient. Now, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate Kikule, who is the, she's a principal technical advisor here at the USAID MTAPS program and the lead for pharmaceutical regulatory systems. Over to you, Kate. Thank you very much, Tamara. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'd uh, like to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, the work that we are supporting in, hum in promoting the agenda of re regulatory harmonization uh, in different parts of the world that we are working. And so I will present um, the, really the, what harmonization is all about and our USID MTAP support in Africa. And also we'll, I will present uh, specifically uh, the collaboration that we are undertaking with Auda NEPAD and with the different uh, regulatory economic communities. So looking at the challenges that uh, are existent in low and middle income countries, there's a great circulation of substandard and falsified medicines. And uh, this issue is, uh, these problems are particularly prevalent in Africa. And uh, the main cause of this is because the national medicines regulatory authorities that are charged with the responsibility to ensure the quality, safety, 
and efficacy of medicines are weak and are not functioning well, as uh, depicted also by the, the results of the uh, WHO global benchmarking tools that are used to measure the functionality of the national regulatory authorities. And so we look at, uh, first of all, we look at the, to, uh, to critically understand what harmonization is all about. It's a process whereby countries come together and adopt uh, similar technical requirements in order to promote the, uh, uh, to, to promote their quality and the efficacy of all the medicines that will be circulating in the market. But since it takes a long time, uh, of late there's been uh, another strategy to promote convergence of um, technical requirements in the different countries by having uh, regulatory authorities uh, work together to share data and information as they in increase the level of of cooperation, and in so doing also the level of harmonization increases as and progresses to a point whereby they can um, have a, a legal a binding um, a, a instrument to ensure that all work together to have uh, these uh, standards uh, achieved and applied in the same manner. And um, the other, a uh, way of using um, smart regulation is also to apply the reliance principles, whereby countries also um, build on the decisions that are already made by other reference or stringent regulatory authorities, and then consider them in their approval process, for example, in the registration of medicines. The other returns we see on harmonization is that um, there is uh, prevention of duplication of efforts so that um, the limited resources available are used in a more efficient manner. And also this facilitates all these processes, facilitates um, and yield better outcomes like boosting the local manufacturing industry because then the manufacturers would uh, use similar procedures to register the products in the different countries in a defined region. And that's facilitating easy access to quality medicines. And um, of course, empowering, uh, ensuring quicker access of these products onto the market. And so we look at the partners that we have been working with um, to implement uh, and foster this agenda of harmonization. We are we are collaborating with Auda NEPAD, which is a co-partner with the USAID MTAPS program, together with the various regional economic communities um, that are aligned with the, under the AMRH initiative. We are looking at what we found before MTAPS started. In, in Africa, there, there there was low technical capacity in the regional secretariats and also weak government structures. And definitely most of the countries are at a low maturity level as defined by, uh, by the WHO GBT uh, measure. And so even looking at a critical area of interest like pharmacovigilance functions, these are weak, especially across border points. So what MTAPS did was to work um, in uh, partnership and collaboration with Auda NEPAD to build on the capacity um, of the regional economy, regional centers of regulatory excellence in order to create a pool, I mean, uh, centers that would uh, generate a pool of uh, experts in the regulatory sciences and uh, facilitate uh, training of pharmaceutical personnel and health workers. We also facilitated them um, and contributed towards um, um, the re uh, application of reliance mechanisms by supporting registration and um, uh, joint dosier evaluation 
in the uh, regional economic community, uh, specifically in uh, Zazibona. So our work specifically in the Eastern and Horn of Africa, um, we have worked to align the priorities with the AMRH initiative and with the specific priorities within the IGAD and ESC region, taking note of the fact that some of the countries uh, belong to both regional economic communities, so they can bring on various uh, expertise and share it uh, across the different countries in the two regional economic communities. And uh, looking further at the East and Horn of Africa, uh, MTAPS has supported uh, local pharmaceutical manufacturers to uh, comply to the good regulatory practices. We performed a survey to understand and determine what the key gaps are in order to inform capacity development of local manufacturers in the two regions, in ESC and IGAD. And after the survey, we convened a workshop to discuss the findings and also agree on the recommended action, uh, action points that would promote compliance to good regulatory practices. Moving ahead uh, to the uh, cross-border areas, MTAPS has supported strengthening pharmacovigilance systems across the border areas uh, between uh, IGAD and ESC. And um, this, we found that there were really weak governance structures. So we worked together with um, the leaders in the, in the, and the health facilities across the borders to a, and sensitize them about the reporting requirements. And uh, this has also fostered the convergence of the processes and guidelines, following the guidelines that are required in the, in the countries that are across the borders. And then moving further ahead, we look at uh, another region. MTAPS has worked to bring um, the 15 member states in the ECOWAS region, uh, specifically to assess uh, and uh, determine the kind of information that they would be willing to share with an agenda to, with the whole game of uh, trying to uh, share knowledge and data that is generated from the different countries so that this is collated in a single uh, focal point. And uh, we have uh, supported the creation and establishment of uh, a web portal where the 15 countries can come together and share information and uh, exchange information and creating also a community of practice. So, um, Moving ahead, the results, of course, are enormous, and uh, we are seeing a greater progress in uh, improving the functionality of regional pharmacovigilance systems, especially across the border areas, and also promoting convergence of uh, medicine regulatory functions, like in the registration of medicines and uh, application of reliance mechanisms together with building capacity of the regional centers of regulatory excellence so that at least within Africa, we have uh, at least centers where the regulatory um, personnel could uh, enhance their knowledge and apply it with, on the continent. All these are geared towards uh, improving on the access or to safe and effective and quality assured medicines. USID MTAPS is also working beyond uh, the continent, uh, taking with uh, supporting the, reg uh, the regional harmonization agenda uh, with the major networks in Asia. And um, we have also, uh, we are currently working to facilitate convergence of standards and te technical guidances, uh, noting that uh, most of the products that are used on the continent in Africa come from Asia. So it is also a good way to at least facilitate um, um, a, a distribution of quality medicines across the globe. And so we are also working, we are planning to uh, 
work with these networks to build capacity of the manufacturers so that they can also comply to the requirements. So in essence, that's what we are doing in, on the continent and uh, really appreciate uh, your time to come and listen to, the, to this uh, webinar and discussions. Thank you, over to you, Tamara. Thank you, Kate. Um, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. So um, we'll now um, take a few questions if there are any. And uh, we see in the chat, there's a question from Akish. Will Zazibona consider PICs or regulatory agencies for reliance? And I don't know if you can address that one, Kate. Kate? Okay, yeah. Um, I, I think Zazibona as a regional economic community, has, they have their own, uh, they have their like terms of references and guidances, but like in terms of, uh, I, I wonder if Sakilu is online, but if she's not, definitely if it is the PIC is the pharmaceutical inspection convention scheme, if that's what you're talking about. And so uh, for, for uh, the pharmaceutical inspection convention scheme is there for it's, uh, they have their own arrangement among themselves. It's an international, non, uh, international organization uh, with members that are uh, selected and have to comply to certain requirements before they are accepted. So as a regional economic communities, the uh, Zazbona can rely on the decisions that have been made by PIC, but for it to be recognized, you have to follow through their processes. Over. Thank you, Kate. And a question from Julie. In all cases, this process must be inclusive and support local manufacturing. Is MTAPS involved in the adoption of GS1 standards? So is MTAPS involved in what? So, the adoption of GS1 standards. GS1 standards, okay. Or oh, GS1 standards. Okay, USID MTAPS um, has, uh, has been involved in um, discussions of implementation of GS1 standards and um, we are, I think we are, we were, we, we have not have been heavily involved in the implementation, but we have been, uh, we've participated in the discussions to apply the GS1 standards. Our sister organization, I think PSM has been working heavily in countries, I think in Rwanda to implement uh, the, these standards, but it's something worth considering. Over. Thank you, Kate. And one last question. Oh, sorry, Kofi, did you want to add something? Yes, I wanted to add to that. Yes, the MTAS is very heavily involved in this. In addition to what Kate said, we are on all the um, participated in Nigeria uh, discussions. We've always been working closely with USAID in Washington. We are also in a working group that is hosted by uh, World Bank uh, to do the development. Our focus has been more on the regulatory aspects for the rollout and implementation of the GS1 standards. And so we are part of that. Thanks. Thank you, Kofi. And just uh, time for one more question from Johannes. Are there, is there evidence that, that show the registration lead time before and after the harmonization? Because reduction in registration lead time is one of the advantages that we expect from harmonization. Yes, uh, thanks for that question. And I think that's the whole goal of um, implementing harmonization initiatives in regional economic communities. Uh, if there is a formal, like um, a formal mutual recognition agreement in place, whereby um, once the countries come together and agree on registering the product is automatically um, like uh, registered in the various countries, then the lead time definitely decreases. However, um, if there is just uh, um, like a, if, if like uh, countries have not put in place uh, mandatory registration of products once they agree uh, after maybe coming together and uh, evaluating the dossier, 
and they have to go back to the individual countries to register the products, then of course that may depend on each of the country's registration timeline. So we see this working, I think, in other blocks. If you look at maybe in the centralized system that's applicable in the European Medicine Agency, and uh, but uh, there is a, a need within the African continent, there is a need to have these mutual recognition agreements in place to facilitate the registration process. But some of the, uh, I think some of the um, regional economic uh, uh, communities, like I think in Zazibona, we've seen uh, some uh, uh, results in terms of expedited uh, evaluation and registration of products. Thank you, Kate. And just a quick follow up from Johannes. Um, uh, thanking you for the presentation and asking whether you can share um, any um, feedback with insights with respect to um, suppliers' reaction for the harmonization. So, how are suppliers reacting to the, these harmonization efforts? Um, based on the interactions that we've had with the suppliers, um, we find that they welcome. They welcome the idea of countries uh, working together to have harmonized medicine regulation requirements because it saves them time. The main concern I think that uh, manufacturers are raising is that I think they are concerned of how uh, to, why they have to you know, pay different fees if you, know, you are working together. So that is something that is worth noting because uh, some of these regulatory agencies depend on um, the fees as a source of income to uh, operate. So there is a need to work out a financing model that, but otherwise I think the manufacturers are really looking at it. We will have more of this, I think when, during the panel discussion, when Dr. Wanyanga also says more about that. Over. Thank you, Kate. Now we're going to move into the panel discussion and we have with us today, um, we have with us today, um, Nan Ms. Nancy Groom, who is substituting for Ms. Uh, Margaret Segonda. And um, she's with the, she's a, a public health officer at Auda NAPAD. We also have Dr. Samuel Azatayan from the World Health Organization. He's a team lead for regulatory convergence and networks. We have Dr. Fred Siao, who is the CEO of Pharmacy, the Pharmacy and Poisons Board at the Kenya Ministry of Health. Um, Dr. Wilberforce Wanyanga, who is a board member of the Federation of African Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. Um, Ms. Sibyl Ose, who is the professional officer in charge, uh, essential medicines and vaccines with the West African Health Organization, or WAHO and uh, Dr. Anthony Toritich, who is a medicine regulatory harmonization specialist with the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or EGAD. So welcome to our panelists, and um, we're very happy to have you here today. Um, we'll, for this session, uh, for this uh, part of the, the webinar, we're just going to direct a few questions to the panelists, and then we'll turn it over to the audience to um, um, uh, uh, ask questions as well of the panelists. So the first question is to you, Nancy. Um, what is the role of the AMR partnership in promoting and enabling medicines, regulatory harmonization and establishment of the African Medicines Agency? Over. Yes, and thank you, Tamara, for the introduction. And maybe just to start with a brief introduction of the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative. As we all know this initiative, was established in 2009 with founding uh, partners, just to start from where Kate explains the challenges that we had on the continent regarding regulatory uh, uh, processes and the medicines registration processes. So after some time, we have had many partners that have actually expressed interest to join the AMRH initiative. And that's where we have the AMRH partnership. And if we can look at what Kate just presented is actually alluding to some of the advantages of the AMRH partnership, in addition to many. So the main aim of this partnership is to uh, coordination of, of partners to ensure that 
There is alignment of strategies, plans, standards of practice. Sometimes we have different guidelines that are being used. We have partners who have different guidelines. For example, we might have a USP using the US guidelines and we could have the European uh, EU using the um, EU guidelines. So the aim of the partnership is basically to minimize uh, duplication and promote efficient use of the limited resources that we have that Kate has already alluded to. So practical examples that have happened within the Air Marriage Partnership is where we had the partnership platform that has been established where we bring the partners to work together to align on areas of interest through the uh, technical committees. So the Air Marriage has uh, various technical committees where partners are being guided to support the technical committees. These committees or the partners supporting these committees are actually called the joint action groups. So the idea is for them to align their efforts and then to uh, minimize uh, duplication. So we've had groups of partners that are expected to actually deliver based on the interest of those technical committees so that we don't duplicate effort. We don't have partners coming in and uh, doing things that are not part of the objectives of the initiative. So subsequently, actually the Air Marriage Partnership will become the regional steering group in Africa for the WHO coalition of interested parties. So the partners are expected to support actually also the regulatory authorities through implementation of the IDPs. I think it also alluded to the issue of um, the WHO benchmarking exercise where we have the member states identifying the institutional development plans and we're expecting partners also in a coordinated effort to support these countries in regulatory systems strengthening. So subsequently, this coordination effort will be anchored in establishing the African Medicines Agency partnership as well. As we are aware, the air marriage uh, assets will be transferred into the African Medicines Agency. And we're also hoping that this partnership will also be part of the assets that will be transferred into AMA. Currently, actually, the air marriage is organizing meetings with the partners to discuss how they can support the establishment of African Medicines uh, agency. So this is also in a coordinated uh, manner. And as you are aware, the AM, uh, AMA has had a long-term relationship basically with the African Union Commission and WHO, who is also part of the secretariat for the AM marriage. So at the moment, we are having many partners that are coming in now with the establishment of the African Medicines Agency who are interested in supporting. So this partnership will transition into that. Air marriage also brings in collective impact. As we know, many partners bringing in the support will clearly have a collective impact. If we have clear priorities, plans, and then the partnership will result in actually achieving the goals of the African Medicine Regulatory Harmonization Program, which is basically timely access to safe and effective medical products on the continent. So I think basically that's a summary of what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, now, uh, the next question is for doc, uh, Dr. Samvel Azatian, who is a pediatrician um, with a PhD in clinical pharmacology and medical products regulation. And over his more than 20 years at the WHO, he has led many roles associated with the regulation of medical products, including supporting regulatory collaboration, convergence, and harmonization, capacity building, and medical products introduction in countries. He is currently leading the regulatory convergence and networks team of the Department of Regulation and Pre-Qualification um, in Geneva. Um, Samuel, the question for you is, how do the efforts of AMRH in the Africa region align with WHO's regulatory system strengthening priorities globally? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tamara, for uh, this question and uh, also for inviting the WHO to be in this uh, panel. As uh, Nancy has mentioned, WHO is a part of a Joint Secretariat for uh, African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative. So uh, we are really uh, interested in uh, um, um, seeing the progress that is uh, taking place in the continent now. And if you look at AMRH, of course, the key objective of this initiative overall is to improve access to uh, most important uh, 
uh, medical products or essential medical products. And, and this objective is, is perfectly in line with the WHO uh, own strategic priorities and our action plan to, to, to improve quality and safety of health products in our member states. And uh, this plan includes many um, uh, things, but two are very important also in the context of Africa. And this is strengthening regulatory uh, um, systems in the countries in line with the drive towards universal health coverage. And the second one, which is critically important also in the context of current pandemic, it is increasing regulatory preparedness for public health emergencies. So as Nancy has mentioned, we are uh, working with AUDA in EPAD and other partners from the first day of establishment of AMRH uh, and, and, and our regulatory system strengthening activities in the context of AMRH, but also globally are, are based uh, on and also informed by the global benchmarking policy and the global benchmarking tool, which is now being uh, uh, implemented uh, also in Africa uh, with the aim to identify the gaps uh, existing in regulatory systems, in national regulatory systems, but also at the regional level, at the level of regional economic communities, uh, MRH uh, projects, and also to propose uh, corrective um, uh, actions to address these uh, objectively identified gaps. And the support to AMRH is also in line with uh, WHO global efforts in overall uh, supporting regulatory collaboration, harmonization and convergence based on reliance and on the aspiration that harmonization and convergence in general could help uh, reduce unnecessary duplications uh, and also can help streamline regulatory processes in the countries and, and the regions. And ultimately this can um, facilitate the accelerated registration of important medical products in the member states. I have seen a question in chat asking whether there is an evidence for uh, uh, shortened timelines for registration pre and post harmonization. And indeed, I can confirm that this information is available. We do have this evidence, which is very obvious and clear. And also in the context of AMRH, WHO, uh, all partners have their roles and WHO's role is a, a key technical support partner, uh, providing technical support in the development of uh, harmonized norms and standards by uh, REC MRH uh, programs, as well as uh, supporting joint activities, dossier assessments and GMP inspector inspections. And so far we have been able to uh, support practically all REC MRH uh, uh, programs or projects in these directions. Also, uh, as it also mentioned briefly by Nancy, we were uh, supporting all regional economic community uh, programs or projects in conducting self benchmarkings of their national and regional uh, uh, situation with the regulation of medical products, not going in depth in each country's uh, system, which is also done at some uh, level with some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, structured approach. But the, the aim for us was to look more horizontally at what is happening in the level of the region, let's say, in IGAD or in ECOVAS or in uh, ESC or in SADAC, and how this uh, existing level of capacity can or cannot facilitate collaboration, work sharing based on reliance. And this is a, a, a critically important process that has been done and, and what I also want to mention, uh, our partners in this process, we have Swiss Medic, which is WHO's technical partner, who is also helping us in, in conducting all these activities. And lastly, also briefly mentioned by Nancy, is another important effort supported by uh, WHO is the, the CIP, Coalition of Interested Parties. It is a platform that brings together various partners, those who are able and willing to offer uh, regulatory system strengthening activities. And the terms of reference for this uh, platform uh, uh, has been finalized and the coalition was officially launched on, uh, in the end of October this year. And the AMRH partnership platform is a part of this uh, uh, effort and is uh, aimed at the consolidation and coordination of supports provided 
by uh, various uh, partners, including also MTAPs and many other partners. So we, we would like to call again for collaboration, coordination of our efforts and uh, on, based on clear understanding of roles and responsibilities, who can do what better and, uh, and uh, how this could be uh, all contributing to uh, improving access to, to medical products in the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. So you've gotten the, a little bit of the uh, regional perspective from Nancy and a bit of the global perspective from Samuel there. And I, I neglected to mention earlier that Nancy is actually, um, she manages the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization um, Partnership, so the AMRH um, platform and, and the development of the regulatory information management system. And she's also um, managing monitoring evaluation for the AMRH program. So um, a, a lot of background there to draw on in your questions that you, phrase, that you frame for the panel. Um, now, so as I briefly mentioned, we got the regional perspective from Nancy and um, we heard a little bit from Samvel about, you know, how the MRH platform and the harmonization efforts in Africa align with the uh, WHO um, RSS priorities. Now we're going to turn to um, Dr. Wanyanga, who is a pharmacist and a healthcare professional. And he's a board member with the Federation of African Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. And um, he's a pioneer member on the board. Uh, which is a continent-wide, uh, sorry, FAPMA, the Federation of African Pharmaceutical Association, is a continent-wide organization of Africa-based manufacturers committed to developing the industry to meet Africa's needs for affordable quality medicines. He's also He has also been the chair of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, and more recently, he has been involved in harmonization work with MTAPS on improving compliance and policy interventions to upgrade local pharmaceuticals manufacturing. And so we'd like to hear a bit uh, of the manufacturer's perspective as you see it, um, Dr. Wanyanga. Um, so what are the regulatory challenges manufacturers face in the current landscape? And how do you see regional harmonization changing that? And we saw also a question related to that in the chat as well. Over to you, Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me uh, to share my thoughts with this uh, distinguished uh, um, panelists and uh, uh, the audience. Uh, uh, let me start by uh, mentioning something just uh, in passing about FAPMA. FAPMA is uh, uh, a continental organization that whose membership draws from the regional um, uh, associations. And the idea is really to bring uh, Africa together to focus on issues of um, the quality of the uh, medical uh, products and also looking at affordability. And much more so that uh, Africa is pre, uh, uh, importing so much from uh, outside. So the question has been, how can we uh, use this uh, uh, platform to encourage and support the African-based manufacturers? And that's what FAPMA is all about. Uh, one of the results, of course, is that uh, we have seen a lot more um, the, the, the governments and the regional associations recognizing the and sitting together with the local manufacturers to because previously this was not the case, but more engagement is happening uh, that the manufacturers are sitting at the same table with the policymakers to see what is best to be done in this era. Now, looking, coming back just to the question, what are the regulatory challenges manufacturers face and current uh, landscape? One may be able to, uh, to say very simply that the challenges between the manufacturers and the, the regulators are intertwined. Uh, intertwined in the way that uh, if one doesn't move, the other one doesn't uh, move either. And if one moves, the other one moves. And the growth has been uh, very good. Uh, the, uh, the, the improvement of the GMP standards, the improvement of the uh, regulatory standards are ever rising and we appreciate that. But looking at uh, them differently is uh, when you look at the uh, manufacturers, they are at different levels of GMP compliance. 
and we see some of them, uh, this ranges from uh, those ones who have very high um, GMP standards um, uh, reaching the uh, WGOPQ levels. And we have those ones who are struggling down who need to come up. And uh, uh, this arises from the fact that uh, most of the investments are in uh, uh, premises which you are rented and sometimes starting off uh, with secondhand equipment and things like that makes it difficult. But this uh, progress uh, on that line. Then there's another problem about the human capacity skills mix among is the industry. Uh, when it comes to new formulations, when it comes to production, when it comes to engineering, such aspects are still giving the challenges. Then of course, that means that we have inadequate, there is inadequate uh, technical know-how in certain, in, in these areas. And uh, it requires really uh, technical support uh, for them to move uh, a little bit faster than it is today. Then of course, there is a, because of the investment nature, uh, we have the investors who have not uh, who may not have a, a fair understanding of the quality management systems. And this mindsetting is one of the bottlenecks uh, because you can be able to see companies where the, 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 there is a, the pharmaceutical quality management systems, the vision is there and so forth, the growth is faster. Uh, and then of course, uh, there is the issue of uh, uh, quality is expensive. The issue of investment, the issue of uh, getting a uh, GMP compliant equipment, technologies, product formulations, uh, these remain challenges uh, among the manufacturers. But when you come to the regulator, uh, there are also a different uh, maturity levels, as has been said earlier. I think uh, Kate uh, mentioned that. And then, of course, uh, the laws, some of them may be not be so modern and they require some reviews to bring them along. And then of course, there are different expertise at the NMRs from different countries. You see that uh, uh, some are stronger in certain areas, some are not as much uh, as strong. Now, one of the other things that is uh, uh, difficult to handle among the regulators is the level and the degree of enforcement, even where they are the laws, uh, the, 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 that aspect uh, requires a little bit more um, uh, uh, what you call standard operating procedure, so to say, uh, because uh, at the moment you find that uh, the law enforcement procedures they are they, they, they are both to, uh, to use uh, the, the judicial system which sometimes is very unfair when it comes to um, uh, dealing with technical matters. And that uh, those procedures and the laws supporting that are some of the areas that one would like to look at. And of course, uh, one would be able to say that uh, the <coughs> national NMRAs have, uh, the funding is not from the exchequer and they have got to collect the resources from uh, the licenses, which is inadequate to get the right uh, uh, kind of personnel, the kinds of skills and the kind of uh, technology that they require. So that is so to say uh, about the challenges, but uh, the MRH has been, uh, is giving uh, uh, quite positively uh, contributing to strengthening of this, uh, both the regulators and the, 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 the manufacturers. Uh, much as we may say, there may be a few delays here and there, uh, but I think uh, MRH is the, the right way to go. However, when we're looking at the MRH, I think the approach is what may be uh, good for the manufacturers if it was shifted or changed a little bit, altered a little bit, in the sense that, uh, uh, Harmonization will bear fruits when the manufacturers say the bottom line also changing. In this, uh, I'm just finishing. 
Uh, one is the, if they started with the uh, manufacturers EMP compliance and helping them, then that would reduce the number of manufacturers they are going to deal with. Then th that would mean that you follow it with the dossier evaluation because there are now much fewer mm -hmm. and packaging of organization products so before conscious. the wow. other mm -hmm. issues uh, 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 come in. And lastly, uh, the, the African Medicine Agency, AMA, has just come into force um, uh, on 5th of November. But one would like to see it uh, um, uh, operationalized quickly. But there is a gap which needs to be filled. And this gap is uh, when you look at the uh, FAPMA is dealing with the regional organizations, uh, associations. But when it comes to AMA, which was an advocate of formation of uh, AMA, you find that we do not, it doesn't seem to look at regional uh, similar regulatory uh, arrangements. And if AMA is to survive, then we have got to look at the regional similar AMA uh, regional uh, agencies that would then be uh, supportive of the apex. Uh, that's what I may have to say for now. Um, I think uh, uh, may have been exceeding the time. Sadly. Thank you all for that very uh, comprehensive uh, overview and, and response. Uh, now we're going to pivot really quickly to um, Dr. Anthony Toritich, who is a pharmacist with over 15 years of experience um, as a regulatory affairs compliance specialist in Africa, both as a quality assessor and a good manufacturing practices auditor. Um, currently, he is the lead regional consultant for the World Bank on regulatory harmonization in the Horn of Africa and a senior quality assessor with the WHO's pre-qualification program. And he is joining us from EGAD. So um, Dr. Toritich or Anthony, um, the question for you is uh, medicines registration, licensing of production facilities and compliance of manufacturers are some critical issues that are impeding access to safe and quality assured medicines in Africa. Can you comment on where the EGAD region is on the path to regional harmonization on these processes? And what are the challenges you're seeing? Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Tamara, and thank you, MTAP's team, for inviting me to speak. And uh, on behalf of IGAD Secretariat, I just want to appreciate and uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak. Um, quickly, uh, IGAD as a regional economic block is uh, a regional economic block in the Horn of Africa for those who are hearing about IGAD for the first time. Uh, it's composed of eight member states. Uh, currently, there are seven who are active. Uh, one is inactive. That is in Ethiopia, Djibouti, Kenya, Uganda, uh, South Sudan, Sudan, and Somalia. Uh, we are we are we are still having. Uh, I think uh, Eritrea has suspended its membership. But generally, we also have a duplicate membership uh, of some member states who are in uh, ESC, both in ESC. And, and in Uganda, that is Kenya, Uganda, and South Sudan. So uh, in, in regard to regional uh, harmonization, I think the journey that uh, IGAD has gone through is, uh, is, 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 a, is a strange one. I think uh, we, we, we joined the harmonization uh, activities quite late when, when it had already started in the EEC. And, 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 and now we have COVID uh, pandemic, which has just affected when we were just trying to kickstart uh, some of the initiatives. Uh, but we started uh, the initiative by working with partners like WHO, World Bank and USID with technical support, specifically from WHO, MTAPS program and USPPQM plus. Uh, and then we, we developed with member states um, a, a, a proposal which is guiding most of the activities that is, that is being implemented currently. Uh, generally, they are focused into three core areas in terms of implementing technical uh, harmonized technical requirements and operational guidelines across the region, uh, implementing uh, convergence of activities through communication, information, and work sharing, and building capacity not only for the regulatory authorities but also for the national pharmaceutical industry. And then the main core areas that, uh, that, that the initiative is working to implement 
is on marketing authorization, that is medicine registration, regulatory inspection, majorly called GMP inspection, post-marketing surveillance, and pharmacovigilance. Um, uh, to clarify, marketing authorization or regulatory inspection is majorly supported currently with WHO and World Bank, and um, uh, and and uh, post-marketing surveillance is is and, and pharmacovigilance is majorly uh, supported by USID through the assistance of uh, USP PQM Plus currently, uh, and formerly USP PQM, and right now also we're having MTAP supporting most of the pharmacovigilance activities in the region. Uh, I don't want to repeat what uh, what Samuel, uh, Kate, and, 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 and uh, Nancy have talked about the business case of having a regional harmonization uh, process. I'll just go directly to the issues that uh, that maybe we have we have exp we are trying to do we are majorly trying to establish a sustainable regulatory system uh, and and increase human resource capacity in the region uh, towards uh, establishing a journey to self reliance igad unfortunately is also a region that has has uh, basically segmented into two uh, uh, member states there are some member states that are very stable politically there are some member states that are quite unstable uh, politically. There are some member states that have have uh, established, in quotes, established at least a regulatory system, whether whether like, we, we are not looking at maturity level three, but at least having some form of regulation. And there are some member states that actually do not have any regulatory system. Uh, so what we do is that we try and work with the countries that are having established regulatory system that is there four, which is uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, Kenya, and Uganda, trying to support the ones that don't have a regulatory system, uh, Somalia, South Sudan, uh, uh, Djibouti. Uh, uh, and, and most of the time, we, we, we work towards trying to implement whatever is agreed. I think we don't want to duplicate resources. We don't want countries to work, uh, to, to continue impl implementing a fragmented regulatory system uh, within the region. So far, with regards to, to, to joint assessment, I think we've done, uh, we are now going to the fifth joint assessment. We've not done a lot. We were affected quite uh, briefly by, with COVID, but we have done a lot of activities uh, with regard to post-marketing surveillance and pharmacovigilance activities, which is uh, majorly supported by USID. We've done cross-border sensitization and, and, and uh, for pharmacovigilance at cross-border areas. We've also done, now we are doing the second round of uh, regional post-marketing surveillance uh, in the region to look at the quality of substandard and falsified medicines, especially for maternal child health. Uh, uh, and, and just to highlight the challenges that we have seen, I would don't want to call it challenges, I would call it areas of improvement based on our experience, is that uh, I think with COVID, because most of our activities actually started being implemented during the com uh, corona pandemic we have realized that that that, that it's possible to do some regional harmonization work virtually uh, but but at least uh, i think from experience we have seen that the technical teams that met physically at least once and now uh, continued meeting physically it, it became better but those ones that have never met it's become a big challenge so we, we really we need to have both a mix of virtual and 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 and, and, and physical, but of importance is strong leadership of NMRS, the national regulatory authorities, in taking lead in these initiatives, because I think majority of the NMRS look at these initiatives as regional, not as na as national national. So we have seen that it is more of secretariat led rather than national led. So and and most of the regulatory decisions made at regional level are not directly linked with the national regulatory uh, system uh, decision making. We have seen again that uh, that engagement of pharmaceutical industry is is small in terms of them trying to to participate in these initiatives because I and and I understand them clearly because majority of the uh, pharmaceutical in, in industries look at which gives them the, the easiest time. So they, comp they, 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 because we are still establishing the system, most of the national 
pharmaceutical industry or even just uh, global pharmaceutical industry are hesitant to go into supporting this regional initiative because they don't know they are not so sure whether whether it's going to give them the, their desired outcomes which is faster registration faster access to the markets uh, so much we have seen that they are quite slow in participating in the activities and the other last area that we really need to improve is the area of information management system because we have realized that countries still do not share critical information for regulatory decision making that that is very important in facilitating uh, reliance and at convergence of activities i want to thank you all thank you very much anthony and um, now we're going to um hear a little bit more uh from the national perspective so we're going to turn things over to dr Xiao, um who is um currently the chief executive officer of the pharmacy and poisons board at the national medicines regulatory authority in kenya He's a pharmacist with vast experience in international, in, in international health, administrative, economic, and policy formulation and implementation. Uh, thanks for joining us, Dr. Siao. And the question for you is, could you comment on progress in pharmacovigilance that has been achieved through the collaborative efforts in the region? And to what extent is a regional approach proving to be advantageous to improving patient safety? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. I, I think speaking among the last is always hard because some things have already been said and uh, I'll be repeating some. So I'll, I'll summarize. Uh, achievements, I'm only talking about what we have achieved. So as a country, we are now a center of excellence for pharmacovigilance and uh, post-marketing surveillance. And before that, we had no compendium of guidelines. And so each country used to do their own thing. But with harmonization and uh, uh, coming on, on of, of uh, the ESC harmonization, then we have developed guidelines uh, which lead to harmonization and efficiency in, in our work. Number three is that there was no curriculum. Each university would do their thing, train people differently. But with harmonization, we now have a harmonized curriculum, which sets the minimum requirements for the training. And so the people coming from the universities are now, we believe we know their, their qualifications. Previously, also people used to do work on their own without following certain procedures but we developed the SOPs. They have been joint uh, GM, uh, sorry, PMS activities, both at border, border points and within countries. I think uh, Dr. Atoroiti talked about that. And then we had no indicators. We were just working, working without knowing what we are achieving. But then we've now developed indicators which are common and we use them across the ESC. And then we build capacity. There are many health workers who have been trained, over 2,000. Previously, there was nobody who was trained, but now uh, we've trained. An example of joint PMS uh, between EGAD and ESC is that of amoxicillin clavulonic acid and oxytocin. And I think Dr. Toretic wrote a paper on that. So those are the achievements. But if it comes to advantages of uh, working together, one is information sharing by working together, which enables us to make, to make quick regulatory uh, decisions. If it's recalling a product, we, we share information across countries and we recall the product across the region. Progressively, we have had industry appoint what we call a qualified pharmacovigilance person. Initially, this was not there. And we are not getting reports from industry. But most of them now, like in Kenya, have appointed the qualified person. And we, we are now getting reports from industry. And then there was twinning between 
the weaker regulatory authorities or uh, and the stronger ones or the mature ones, the least mature and the mature ones. So that they've been able to bring the ones that were lower to almost the same level. Um, I think also structures, structures, we formed structures, they became of need because of what we needed to do. And like in Kenya, we now have what we call the pharmacovigilance expert review committee. Previously, this was not there. So I see that as an advantage because as a regulator or a CEO, I'm not able to see to sit and review pharmacovigilance reports, but we now have a committee which does that work. I think I will end there, uh, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, we have our last panelist, um, just as equally important Sybil. Uh, we have Ms. Sybil Assay, uh, who is a pharmacist who has been at the West African Health Organization as a professional officer in charge of pharmaceuticals for 11 years or so. She is now the acting principal program officer for public health and head of the vision at WAHO. She coordinates the West Africa Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative and develops human resource capacity in the economic community of the West African states or ECOWAS um, region, uh, where the focus is on strengthening national medicines regulatory systems and um, local pharmaceutical manufacturers, training local manufacturing pharmaceuticals on good manufacturing practices. And she's currently coordinating the ECOWAS COVID-19 Vaccines Task Force. Thanks for joining us, Sybil. The question for you is, what have been some of the major challenges WAHO has faced in medicines regulatory harmonization efforts in the ECOWAS region? And how are these challenges being addressed? And what do you see as some of the major benefits of the new um, PG platform um, for ECOWAS member states and beyond? Thank you, Tamara. And I also wish to thank uh, MTAPS for continuous collaboration with ECOWAS, in particularly well, Yes, um, as has been said by um, Nancy and uh, Samuel and most of the speakers, the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization has actually done as well on the continent in the sense that before the then, the individual countries were working in silos and the capacity and reliance and actually also building the new horizon to ensure access to medicine was a bit weak on the continent and of course we service um, the ECOWAS region. But when we had opportunity to um, get the support from the World Bank Consortium in 2017 to 2018 to 2020 as of now, uh, we have done a lot of work in building capacities and uh, um, having a joint assessment procedures, terms of registration inspections, having a lot of expert working groups coming out with documentations and other um, um, training capacities that have built their resilience and strength in, in their regulatory functions. And I would also want to appreciate the VHO for the work they've done in the global benchmarking tool, which has left, led a lot of the um, regulatory agencies to build the regulatory functions this service um, for vigilance and also had given us the opportunity for almost all the regulatory agencies to improve the capacity. So now we can probably say that we have uh, maturity level three, which is the FDA Ghana within our region. And the other um, NMRAs are pushing hard to also arrive at that point. Yes, we have had um, a lot of um, Joint assessment, we have received about 21 doses. We have put for given one UA. And you know, we are moving on. Even currently, there's the S working group are doing an assessment on three um, doses that we have received, evaluating it. But that's to say that it's a continuous process. We have not arrived. And of course, there are challenges that we are facing, even though the regulatory organization effort has been very effective so far. The initial challenge is that most countries have still not you know, gotten strong in it to approve 
or provide the market authorizations or issue it as rapidly needed. Normally we were hoping that between the 60 to 90 days when a product has been approved by the steering committee, which makes up the, all the 15 NMRs coming together, they would quickly through this uh, specific period of time, provide the market transition for the applicant when they present their, those, uh, their letters to the countries. Somehow, some are also a bit long because the, they have commissions and committees in country who want to see more issues who needs to be educated more and probably um, understand what is going on better than we think. So far, the first product we had, we've had only nine countries, approved, which is growth in jail. And then we actually continue advocating to make sure that um, we're able to do it. And then the other three products that have recently been approved as well with the EUI, we're working towards it. I think it's a matter of education and getting everybody involved, not only the regulators, but those members who also joined them at the commission or the committee, national committees to approve the products to give market participation. Now, the, the next um, issue is the product dossiers. We still are getting um, lesser applicants as we expected, probably our procedures and have to be improved and our timelines and windows have to also have to be strengthened. So that is also another challenge that we're facing. And we're looking at that into enhancing our communication for the applicants. And we've also increased the, the windows submission. We used to have it manually to twice a year, but then the same committees are proved that we go every quarter, which is four times a year. So I think that would in, uh, improve the number of um, submissions to the joint assessment process. The next uh, uh, issue would probably be in relation to the fact that we have three different languages in our sub -region. Sometimes our procedures are a bit lengthy because we have to translate every document the principal document is from French, you have to translate into English and French, English and Portuguese. If it's in English, it has to be French and Portuguese as well. And sometimes the translation time also um, prolongs some of the delivery that we have to give. So that sees us a, a challenge as well. Yes, the our process, which is the NMRA, is still young. So we need to do a lot of publications to make it as more feasible and then also be able to tell our story stronger than we, we are doing now. So that I think would address some of the challenges. Yeah, we have been fortunate to have products coming from Europe and also from India and uh, East Africa and within our South West Africa, but I think that is not enough. So we need to do more uh, uh, publications and also open up to public. Um, in terms of the systems development, when we, we started, we realized that there was a need to also have a web portal where um, transparency would for the submission and other from scale sector developments would be seen. And that's one of the visibility um, tools that we're gonna use. And from our co-vigilance um, was an important level uh, component, so therefore it is included. So MTAP came in to support that area on the platform. And that component, we've gone through it. We've had a lot of conversation with member states. We've made a lot of contribution to how they want to see the from vigilance being implemented on that platform. We've had um, Ansori Cloud and SharePoint be paid for MTAP as well, who has also approved some funds to extend it. We've also had opportunity to develop a data sharing agreement, which member states are currently signing and also responding. Remember the, the survey that we did as well with the support of MTAP, also provide an insight into what um, members would want to see in, in, in the from vigilance uh, applications. So these are some of the areas we're looking at, especially where we are in the COVID period, where um, the AUF, which is the adverse um, effects following immunization is very important through the vaccination process that is going on. We need to actually embrace all this aspect to be able to tell us what is really happening on the ground. Now, having said that, we realized that as was said by one of our previous um, speakers, 
we need to grow and be sure that we institutionalize the regulatory harmonization process. So in, in 2012, when we, were we thought of developing a COAS regional capacity plan, one of the key elements was regional capacity development and harmonization. And we saw it as being a platform or a foundation for which an agency would be formed in the region. Unfortunately, within the same period, by 2015, um, African uh, NEPAD and African Union also thought of developing the, um, uh, creating the AMA. So it actually coincided with our plan. So we went for, and in 2019, the heads of ministers in the region accepted the creation of, um, or adopted a resolution to create the regional agency, which we call it the Okuma. And today, as we hear, we are in a, another section of the Health Minister's Assembly, and we've adopted the policy regulation and legislation to ensure that the ECOMA, which is the original agency, develops, so it becomes a strong pillar for AMA to be able to work effectively. I believe that the other rights will also follow. So it's, it's just an institution that will actually make the regulatory organization process more sufficient and sustainable. And again, it will be a, an individual or two people managing the whole organization process. It will be a whole institutional structure that will make it more effective, faster, and more transparent for um, applicants uh, to apply and for to improve access to social medicine in the sub region. So this is what I want to uh, submit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sibyl. So um, I think the panel has done a very good job of painting for us a picture of uh, the reg regional harmonization efforts. Um, um, you know, both from a global perspective all the way down to the sub-regional and the national perspective. And we also had Dr. Wanyanga talk a little bit about things from the manufacturer's perspective as well. So um, we want to spend a little bit of time now and open it up to the audience for questions. And we already have uh, two questions. Um, the first one I think is meant for um, Sambal, if you're, yep. Uh, there are other continent-wide complementary initiatives that are being implemented with the support from uh, the African Union, one of which is the African Medicine Supply Platform, established to procure and supply medicines to the African countries using a coordinated procurement approach. Are there efforts to align such efforts um, to such efforts like the African Medicine Supply Platform to encourage suppliers that have certificates from, for example, the MRH platform? And I think that question is for um, a sample. Yeah, I think this question could be also uh, <clears throat> maybe answered by uh, Nancy, Nancy partly. The, 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 the thing is that <clears throat> indeed the whole effort in, in the continent is aimed at increasing uh, capacity of uh, uh, national regulatory authorities in the continent, but also uh, regional uh, bodies, regional entities, such as uh, ECOVAS, such as uh, EGAD or um, SADAC or EAC or, or whatever it is. Uh, we, ho we hope and we expect that one day um, um, these uh, regional bodies, uh, but also some selected uh, regulatory authorities will be able to achieve uh, appropriate maturity level, which will be either three or four, that would allow them to serve as a reference authorities whose uh, opinion, whose uh, uh, marketing authorization or, or scientific opinion or whatever it will be uh, called, will be authoritative enough to be acceptable by uh, uh, regional or national procurement agencies. And uh, if there is a continental effort on this, uh, then uh, I don't see why it cannot be aligned. This is the expectation. And even the, the whole move towards establishment of AMA is to have a continental uh, regulatory body that will be authoritative and whose decisions will be acceptable by all member states in, in Africa. And then if such a body will be able to issue uh, certificates, valid certificates up acceptable by uh, all parties in the continent, then, uh, then I don't see any reason why this cannot happen. Thank you, Samuel. Um, 
Another question is, um, is there any discussion in the AMRH to accept GMP certificate issued by the PIC's members so as to expedite product approval? And I guess maybe this question is for Nancy or maybe Samuel as well, if you can respond. Yeah, I may start again and uh, happy to ask Nancy to contribute. Uh, I'm not aware of such uh, discussions, but uh, what is also uh, uh, true is that uh, the, the whole concept of AMRH is that um, as much as possible to implement uh, reliance as a concept in the continent, in the area of the assessments, in the area of GMP inspections. Uh, now, uh, PICS is a global uh, initiative uh, which is uh, uh, well known and, uh, and reputable. And uh, many uh, countries are relying on uh, the inspections conducted by uh, PICS or PICS member countries or inspectorates to uh, uh, streamline their own inspection practices and uh, um, avoid unnecessary duplication. So if it is up to the country, up to the uh, individual country, if they can put it in their own regulation that they accept uh, certificates issued by PICS countries for their own sake, then it is up to them. No one can restrict them from uh, relying on uh, the inspections uh, done by PICS members to uh, inform their own national decision. In fact, this is what we are trying to uh, promote as much as possible also through AMRH. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. I don't know if um, Nancy, if you have anything to add um, in response. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you, Tamara. I think uh, actually Samvel has given a very good response to the two questions. And just to add to the African medicine supply platform that especially if this is an African Union uh, institution or is a program implemented through the African Union, then definitely there can be areas of alignment and collaboration with the AMRH initiative, which is also an initiative of the African Union uh, Commission as well. So I think we can work on this and see how to align the efforts. And the area of GMP certificates, I think Samvel has done justice to that. AMRH actually working through the technical committees are also looking at uh, establishing a technical committee on the GMP, which might make some of these issues uh, clear and discussed in, in such a technical group. So as this is established, I think we're going to have a very clear approach on issues on GMP inspection as a continent through the technical committee. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, switching gears a little bit, we all know we're working in the midst of a pandemic. And so um, we one question for uh, open to the, the panel, um, you can respond as you see fit. How has the pandemic affected the harmonization momentum? Um, has the need for COVID vaccines and related medical products um, changed the, um, the, the business as usual mode for regulatory agencies and manufacturers in countries? I think was Anthony, you had alluded to this in your in your response earlier, and I think Sybil also mentioned a little bit about the pandemic and its effects, both on the implementation of activities and um, moving forward. Sorry, Fred, you had something to say? No, no, I, I was asking if it was meant for me. Oh, it's open to the panel, so please go ahead. You've elected yourself to go first. Please go ahead. No, I, I didn't get it. You are saying the impact of. Uh, so how pandemic. has how has the pandemic affected the harmonization momentum and um, has the need for COVID vaccines and related medical products? How has that affected uh, the business mode for regulatory agencies and manufacturers in countries? So maybe you want to give it a go and then we can um, call on Dr. Wanayanga to follow up. OK, what, what, what I would say is uh, with the pandemic, we had to change the way we were working. First of all, there were office committees between countries, like in the EAC. 
So we, we resorted to virtual meetings. And actually one positive thing is that it accelerated the use of, of, uh, of uh, the virtual meetings. We were no longer traveling. So the other area that, that the pandemic affected was uh, the focus, focus on the products to be used. One, we started with the PPEs. Uh, we focused on sanitizers. So we gave, we gave them priority because they are required. And then came the vaccines. Now, they were very novel and we had to use reliance, what, what uh, Samuel was saying. We, we, we started making guidelines, adopted some from the US FDA and WHO. And we say that if a product is registered or authorized by any of the two, then we would uh, uh, just go through the documents to make sure they are, they are the same. And then we, we also give the authorization. So it, some of it helped in harmonization in some parts, but some of it was negative, some of it is positive. But already we can see that we are now in the stage of uh, monitoring the, the side effects of those vaccines. And I think very soon we will start now going to full registration, like what has been done in the US. So we have a lot of data now because we collect the data for every vaccination that's done. So plenty of it to be analyzed, and then we will be able to know the safety. So maybe somebody else can. Yep, <laughs> thank you, Fred. And uh, while you have your hand up, so wow, and then we'll turn it over to Sibyl. And we're close to time, so please keep your response as brief as possible. Over to you, Wow. Yeah, there are good things out of bad situations. And uh, one of the things that I think that we need now to move towards is GMP inspections uh, for foreign manufacturers. If we can come back now to um, online evaluations of GMP, that will do a lot more good and uh, reduce the costs of traveling across and uh, doing these inspections. So I, I, I think that uh, there are other advantages uh, when we start focusing much more on uh, what are we getting because previously it was not possible to inspect all the companies, but now it is uh, virtual, uh, by with the virtual uh, inspections that is possible. What is needed is just to make the guidelines. Secondly, it will need also to improve the capacity of inspectors when they are doing the, the desk evaluation of, uh, of the GMP thing. What do they ask for? What do they get for? And uh, what are they looking for? And then thirdly, of course, that the manufacturers will be more, uh, they will know that it is faster to um, uh, approve their GMPs and they'll be more cooperative and more uh, it, will, it will be more cost effective in that way. So there is a silver lining uh, at the end of it all in terms of manufacturing and the GMP approvals. <laughs> thank you. Over to you, Sibyl. Yeah, um, I, thank you. I think it made, it made us rearrange our lives and we never, we never stopped working. So we became more reliant in the sense that uh, particularly as uh, uh, Robert was, was talking about uh, GMP, we were able to do desktop and remote uh, inspection, collaboration with a typical example with UAC and the WHO, and then they searched further and, and they collaborated also with the applicant itself and they were able to do a GMP without actually uh, visiting the site, which was also very effective. And then they the, the were able to develop an SOP to that effect, to be able to aid what we were doing. In terms of registration, the same way, we had a lot of um, virtual meetings. So work, so even currently, like I said, there's a virtual meeting going on on the evaluation of it from few doses. So it actually didn't stop work from, you know, from being done and done well. So it helps us to rather bond together and to work effectively. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you, Sibyl. And then we'll just close with a quick um, question for you, Kate. Um, a question from Chantal. Can non-participating member states access the data captured in the regional PV system? Are there plans to expand to other regional economic communities or even continental-wide platforms such as um, AMA? Um, so Kate, just a quick response because we're at time. All right, thanks Chantel for that question. Yeah, yeah the, the, the idea is to have information that is accessible to the public and also to the uh, ECOWAS member states and also to within the regional, you know, within the member states. But um, there is also like MTAPS is trying also to promote the use of this uh, kind of arrangement uh, to other regional economic communities. We have uh, received also expression of interest from Sadak Zazibona. So the ultimate is to have, you know, all like the regional economic communities having these platforms and then they converge uh, through the AMA system. But uh, Sibyl and uh, Nancy could talk more to that. Over. Thank you, Kate. Unfortunately, yeah. we're, we're at time. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. let me add on to what Kate has said. Actually, the World Portal allows access by member states and non-member states, including partners. If Dizani said that the, the, the request of the client who wants to assess will have to ask permission from the administrator and will give specific uh, code or let's say password to be able to enter so that we can, because of security reasons, it's not just open, but then we have to seek for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sibyl. Um, special thanks to the panelists for very um, engaging insights um, that you provided uh, today. And um, I want to thank the audience for all their questions. I'm now gonna quickly turn it over to Emmanuel Enfor, who is the technical director for USAID MTAPS and he'll provide closing remarks. Thank you everyone for your attention. Over to you, Emmanuel. Thanks, Tamara. And thanks everyone for an interesting uh, webinar. A lot of information has been shared. Uh, we have seen opportunities that exist that can enable a fast tracking of this effort to attain harmonization, you know, beginning with the coordination under the Africa Medicines Regulatory Harmonization and its joint action groups. We've heard about the global benchmarking tool that helps to identify regulatory capacity gaps and to propose corrective actions. The coalition of interested parties is a platform also that uh, brings together partners for coordinated support. Uh, we've heard from the Federation of Africa Pharmaceutical Manufacturer Association, the platform for engagement. And I think when we uh, heard about EGAT's effort, I think there's room there for improved uh, engagement and collaboration between FAGMA and EGAD. And uh, we've seen also some of the opportunities like with the Africa Medical Supplies Platform and its effort to vet manufacturers. This is one of the offshoots from, from the effects of COVID. And we can see that uh, that's, that's also an interesting uh, initiative and opportunity to continue this effort. Uh, clearly, there are some achievements uh, that have been registered. We heard from the pharmacy, uh, the Kenya Pharmacy and Poisons Board, their achievements, you know, following the uh, EAC harmonization uh, efforts that illustrates the benefits. This is similar with what we know is happening with the Southern African Development Community, SADAC Zazibona. We heard also from ECOWAS uh, with the efforts through uh, West Africa Health Organization. This provides evidence of pursuing convergence of technical standards, guidelines, and medical products and regulation. So we can see that clearly progress has been made, but several challenges remain. So this requires a redoubling of efforts. You know, we, we all need to redouble our efforts among partners and the stakeholders to ensure that the current gains, you know in regional harmonization are sustained and that we can have even better achievements you know, going forward. So I would like to thank uh, our COR, Alexis, who opened this uh, webinar with some helpful remarks. Thank all the panelists, Kate, for the presentation. We thank uh, 
Tamara for good coordination. Thank the organizers. And we thank you. Uh, I believe we will leave with more information and ready to uh, move forward on this effort to achieve regional harmonization with the ultimate goal of assuring quality assured, safe medicines for the populations that we serve. Thank you all so much for participating.